I've entitled this message, When They Had Sung a Hymn. When They Had Sung a Hymn. In Matthew's account, the marginal reading with regard to this verse speaks of Psalm 113 through 118. And it's been said that after the Passover meal, these psalms would be sung. I went back and read them, and I can see why they would be. But there's something so powerful and striking about this. After the Lord has, for lack of a better word, instituted the Lord's table, they get up, and I have no doubt who is leading in the singing of this hymn. The Lord led them in the singing of this hymn. Now, I'm going to be preaching the gospel from this, but this is a subject I've never preached on before. Singing. Singing. Uh, I first made my first attempt at preaching and. 1978, that's the first time I ever tried to preach. I don't know if I'd call it preaching, I tried. I felt awful about it, but many messages since then, I don't know how many thousands of messages I've preached, and I've never preached upon this subject singing. When they had sung a hymn. Now the Lord knew he would soon be nailed to a cross. That's coming right up. He was going to be betrayed right after this. And he knew this. His hour was come. He knew he would soon be forsaken by his father. He knew, and what I don't understand any of this, only he does. He knew he would be banished from his father's presence. He knew he would suffer the full equivalent of hell. He knew all those things. As a matter of fact, Psalm 88 says, I've been afflicted from my youth. Uh, his suffering did not begin in Gethsemane's garden. He had this pressing on him from the beginning. You remember when he said, I must be about my father's business? He knew what his father's business was, even as a youth. And he was waiting for this time. So they'd observed the Passover and what that must have been. You'll remember he said, with a desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you. And after that, they began the Lord's table. We considered that last week. And after the Lord's table was finished, they sang a hymn together. One of the things that we know about heaven is there will be singing. We read of that great heavenly choir composed of 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. And the scripture says regarding these ones, they sang a new song. Now this is repeated by David, the sweet psalmist, of Israel six different times. Sing a new song unto the Lord. Now that's not talking about composing new lyrics that haven't been written before. These lyrics are eternal. They come from the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But they should only be sung as a new song. What is news? It's what's happened today. It's what's in the present. The gospel is good news. And the songs are to be sang as the new song. Now, whenever I hear the gospel and it's old, that's happened to you, hasn't it? I know it has. It's happened to me. Whenever you hear the gospel and it's old, it's old. If the gospel's preached, there's one reason for that. 
I'm not hearing as a sinner. You hear as a sinner, the gospel will be new and fresh and powerful to you. They sang a new song. Eternally new and eternally fresh. And this will be the employment of heaven. Listen to the words of this new song. I'm quoting from Revelation 5. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Now this is referring to when the lion of the tribe of Judah that was the lamb that had been slain came to the throne of God and he didn't ask for the book. He took the book. Nobody else could do that, but he could. And he was worthy to open the seals thereof. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hath. Don't miss that. He hath redeemed. He didn't offer us redemption. He didn't make redemption available. He hath redeemed us. To God by his blood, he's redeemed us by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us kings and priests unto our God. Now that is sung to him in this great heavenly choir who said, Behold, I make all things new. Singing. I want to read a passage of Scripture from Zephaniah. And if you can find it, I'm going to go ahead and start reading it. You can just listen if you want. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty We just heard about him. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea do obey him? The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee. What's that last phrase? With singing. Do you know that if you're in Christ, you make the Lord, I say this reverently, but I don't know how else to say it, you make him so happy looking at you, beholding you, that he sings. That's what the scripture says. Look at the words again, or if you're there. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy, with mirth. He will rest in his love. And that word rest means he will be silent in his love. There's nothing to bring against you as an accusation. He'll rest in his love. That complete saving love. He'll rest in his love. He will joy over thee with joy singing. It said of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the midst of the church will I sing praise to thy name. Wouldn't you have loved to seen him leading the disciples in this song? But you know, that's what eternity is going to be. It seems as if eternal days are far too short to sound his praise. Now this is what the employment of heaven will be, singing his praise. When Paul said, I will sing in the Spirit, that certainly means this singing that is inspired by the Spirit of God. Turn with me for a moment to Acts chapter 16. I think this is such a powerful, poignant passage of Scripture. Acts chapter 16. Verse 23, this is speaking of Paul and Silas. 
And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stalks. Now picture this in your mind. They've been beaten with the cat of nine tails, blood still flowing down their back in just a filthy, disgusting environment in the inner prison. Their feet fast in stalks for preaching the gospel. And what did they do? Verse 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. What must that have sounded like? In that condition, at midnight, they sang. Praises to God, and the prisoners heard them. I don't know what all that means, but I like to think about what they must have been thinking. What in the world is going on? They're singing praises to God. Look where they're at. How could they do that? But there they were in this time of need, singing praises to God. Now certainly a part of congregational worship is singing. When we sing these hymns, these hymns of praise, we're singing His praise. And to treat singing as less important or more important is wrong. Now what do I mean by that? Well. There are some, I don't guess you call them churches, they're religious organizations, but the main thrust is the singing. And the song leader is called the worship leader. And that's a totally skewed view of what worship is in the first place. There's no understanding in that kind of thing. It's a production. It's trying to uh, move people with music. It's using music to try to get some kind of end. It's not the praise of God. And also remember, when, we were sing- when we're singing these hymns, don't think, well, this is not as important as something else. Yes, it is. This is his praises. This is, we're singing of him. We're singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. We should all participate and join in in the singing of these hymns. They are of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, these are congregational hymns, and in these sing- hymns, We are singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. That's what the scripture says. Now, you don't have to have a beautiful voice. You see, what's beautiful is what's being sung and who's being sung to. You don't have to have a beautiful voice to join in these congregational uh, songs because the beauty is in the hymns and what they say of the Lord. I love the hymn, We Love to Sing of Christ our King, and hail him, blessed Jesus, for there's no word ear ever heard so dear, so sweet as Jesus. What a blessed privilege to be able to sing these hymns, just like the disciples were. This is no less important than when they were getting with the Lord and singing these hymns. The David said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And then there are the specials. Psalm 33, verse 3 says, Sing unto him a new song. There's that word, new, powerful, fresh. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud voice. Now, I've been so touched by these specials. I'm thankful. I'm still, I don't know how many times Lynn said, You ought to say something more. I guess I, I don't think about it. I'm going to, I should. But when I'm getting up, I'm thinking about the message I'm going to preach. But I'm so blessed by these specials. I'm so thankful for them. And this is important. It's important that the singers of specials are gifted to sing. That's very important in a special. Not so they can perform. Every believer is offended by somebody getting up and performing. I mean, you sing a special, it's not about some kind of performance. But you want to have a a, a music, a, a a gifted voice so that you don't get away in the way of the song. 
and you can hear what's being said and worship and think about what's being said. That's very important. Play skillfully with a loud noise. You don't want to be a distraction. You don't want to get away in the way of the message of the song. That's so important, and you know that. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 15, I will sing with the Spirit, and I'll sing with the understanding also. Now, this is so important. <laughs> a song that doesn't impart the understanding of the gospel is a song that ought not be sung. A song that doesn't exalt the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is a song that should never be sung. It's a song for infidels, not for believers. Now, I know that there's some that only sing psalms because there are no error, there's no error in the psalms. And you know, about just about every hymn we sing, you can think, ah, there's a better way to say that. And, well, a man wrote it. A man wrote it. That, uh, but somebody says, well, should we sing those? Well, I think that's exactly what Paul's talking about when he said, let us sing in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Now, think of the sum of the songs we sing. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself. In thee, let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. What a blessed thing it is to sing that song in our hearts. Alas, and did my Savior bleed? And did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity. Grace unknown. And love beyond degree. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauties are, my glorious dress, midst flaming worlds in these arrayed, may I with joy lift up my head. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner, condemned, unclean, when I stand before thy throne, dressed in beauty, not my own. When I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. Now, I, we could go on and on with these songs, but these songs are the preaching of the gospel, aren't they? That's what they are. We were preaching the gospel when we're singing, um, uh, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, these songs preach the gospel. They touch the soul. And they do not have the discordant noise of human will and merit to mar the melody. They're gospel songs. I love when David said, God is king over all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of mercy and judgment. You just read that passage of scripture, a just God and a Savior. I will sing of mercy and I will sing of judgment. That's the gospel. <laughs> I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. 
Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Now that's the subject of our singing. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord. Now singing that is profitable, whether congregational singing, specials, or singing in your heart, it's the work of the Spirit of God. Now turn with me for a moment to Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And here's what that looks like. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I've already touched on Revelation 5 that gives us this view into heaven and what a view it is of when the Lamb took the book. But I would like us to look at another song in closing in Revelation chapter 14. I don't know how to put this uh, song to verse. I don't know how to sing it, but it's the, this is a song. Now turn with me to Revelation 14. This is heavenly worship. And I, and I looked, this is John speaking, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. How many times do we read in the book of Revelation of the Lamb of God? Weep not, the Lion of the tribe of Judah will prevail. And I looked and beheld a Lamb as it had been slain. Here's this Lamb. And I looked and lo, a Lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him an hundred forty-four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now, I realize that, uh, I can't remember if it's the Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses, but they think there's only going to be 144,000 people in heaven. And these are the people. And there's going to be a whole lot more than that in heaven. This is a big number that re represents an exact number, but this number represents the elect of God. An exact number. It's a big number, but it's an exact number. And every one of these elect sinners, those God chose before time began, someone says, what's election mean? Here's a real simple answer. The Lord looked at his disciples and said, you did not choose me, I chose you. And you know that so if you're a disciple. You know it so. No disciple of Christ has any problem with election. They love election. That's who the elect are, and they have the What's it say about them? They have the name of their father written in their forehead. Jehovah Tzidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and the voice of a great thunder. This is talking about the loudness, the volume of this Glorious choir singing. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne. Now, like I said, this is not new lyrics. These are eternal lyrics. But they're always new and they're always fresh. They're always powerful. I need these lyrics just as much now as I ever have. They sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Do you know the only people that can learn this song are people who have been redeemed by Christ? Nobody else really understands. It's, it's, not, it's not resonating with them. They don't get it. But the 144,000 do. They were redeemed. The 
redeemed how I love to proclaim it. He redeemed me. He put away my sin. It's gone. Oh, what a song that the redeemed, only the redeemed can understand this. You know, only a believer can understand the gospel. It just doesn't make sense to a natural man. He doesn't understand anything about sin. He doesn't understand anything about his need of Christ. But the redeemed know this song. And look what it says. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now this is the description of every one of these 144,000. Every one of God's elect. Everybody for whom Christ died for, they were not defiled with women. And does that mean that they've never had the relationship? Everybody knows what we're talking about. It doesn't have anything to do with it. It doesn't have anything to do with it. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 11. Hold your finger there. Paul said in verse 2, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And that's exactly what that is referring to. But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The onlyness of Christ. Now listen to me real carefully. All I have is Christ. And if you add anything to that, that's adultery. All I have, I'm not looking anywhere else. I'm not looking to anything about me. All I have, the only hope I have is that Jesus Christ is all in my salvation. I do not have anything else. And if I do, I've been corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Now, if you are singing this song, you understand that the only hope you have is that he shed his precious blood for you and put it away. And the only hope you have is that his merit, his righteousness is your righteousness. You're not looking anywhere else. You're not thinking of anything else. And to do so is to be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Now go back to Revelation 14, verse 4. Here's the ones who were singing this song. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they're virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. Now the only way to follow Christ is to keep your eyes on him. It's that simple. You know, people uh, uh, overcomplicate this I remember when the uh, first time I went to Mexico uh, with, um, uh, to visit Walter there, and he took us downtown in that downtown area. And it was very intimidating to me. For third world, I'd, I'd never seen anything like that. And Walter, bless his heart, he felt no need to uh, watch out for us. He'd just take off, and all of a sudden, he'd, he'd be gone. And uh, you, you were dead. You know what? The only way you could stay up with him is keeping your eyes on him nonstop. And that's what faith in Christ is. I remember one time, first time I went with Henry, and um, Walter left us, and we were all sitting there, and none of us knew what to do. And Henry said, I feel like an Arminian preacher, leading people without having any idea where I'm going. <laughs> uh, uh, at any rate, the, the point is, when you follow Christ, there's only, you don't look down at your walk, you don't look at others' walks, you keep your eyes totally on that's what it is to follow him, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, let's go on reading. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits 
unto God and the Lamb. Now here we have the effectual redemption of Jesus Christ for his elect. These were redeemed from among men. You know, there's not a drop of gospel in general redemption, saying that Jesus Christ died for everybody, but it's up to you to accept what he did to make it work for you. There's no gospel in that. Somebody preaches that doesn't know God. They don't know the gospel. No, we understand redemption. These were redeemed from among men. Christ Jesus didn't have a redemption that doesn't redeem. Everybody he died for, they must be saved. We understand the words, don't we? We understand that. Look what it says. Being the first fruit unto God and the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no guile, no deceit. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking, there's plenty of deceit by mouth. I mean, every time I open my mouth, there's an element of deceit to it. I mean, everything I say, I say in such a way with a slant to it to make me look better, uh, deceitful, deceitful. So what, is, what does it mean in their mouth is found no guile, no deceit? I have no doubt that this is referring to what David said in Psalm 32, 1 and 2, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is forgiven covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin and in whose spirit there is no guile. Now if you don't believe you personally are totally depraved. I'm not talking about believing the doctrine of total depravity. I'm talking about you believing that you yourself are totally depraved. If you don't believe that you're filled with deceit. That's all you can say. You're a deceitful person. Don't trust you. Don't trust anything you say. Uh, that is deceit. This godless spirit is the result of the new birth. You know, when we sing, Other refuge have I none, hangs my helpless soul. On thee, leave, oh, leave me not alone. Still support and comfort me. All my trust on thee is stayed. All my help from thee I bring. Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of thy wings. Thou, O oh Christ, art all I want. More than all in thee I find. Raise the fallen, cheer the faint, heal the sick and lead the blind. Just and holy is thy name. I am all unrighteousness. False and full of sin I am. Thou art full of truth and grace. Now, when the guileless soul sings that song, he's not just singing the words. He means it. He believes that's the truth concerning him. But look at this last description of these who sing this song with the great thunder, the voice as of many waters. It says in verse 5, they are without fault. It doesn't say they are treated as if they have no fault. They are without fault. God looks at these people and he says, Thou art all fair, my love. There's no spot in thee. You're perfect through my comeliness. You're beautiful. You're without fault. Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. Now understand this, child of God. 
when God looks at you, he starts singing. He sees you as beautiful, as without fault. He says, I'm going to rest in my love or be my silent in my love. There's not going to be any accusations against you. They've all, all your sins put away. That doesn't mean it can come back up. It's gone. It's gone. It's not just covered up to be brought back up at some time. It's gone. It is not. This describes every believer. They are without fault. It's what the Bible calls justification. Now, when the Lord led the disciples in the singing of this hymn, he knew he was going to the cross to make his people without fault. This was part of the joy, looking unto Jesus, who for the joy, the joy that was set before him, the joy, yes, of glorifying his Father and pleasing his Father, but the joy of taking every one of his people and making them to be without fault, spotless before the throne of God. Now, in heaven, what is the subject of the song? Redeemed. <laughs> Isn't it the same subject here? Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for the privilege of being in this great choir that sounds as many waters and as mighty thunder, singing worthy as the lamb that was slain. Lord, how we thank you for the redeeming work of our Redeemer that makes us to be without spot before thee. We give thanks for your gospel. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.